Thank you. All right. Did you get an idea of what somebody is going to have for lunch? Or maybe they already ate. Did they, anybody already ate, eaten, ate, whatever the word is? Anybody, they said they're going to have ham? Yeah. Yeah. How about uh, roast beef? Chicken? Ribs? Fish? Oh, no, you don't want fish on Resurrection Day. How about cow liver? I love cow liver if it's cooked right. How many of you ever had cow liver? It's got to be cooked right with onions. How many would never in a million years ever? You wouldn't? Okay. How about you that are watching? I'll tell you, one of my favorite meals, and Brenda cooks it amazing, and you got to put mint jelly with it, is lamb. How many of you ever had? I'm talking about lamb. What do they call them? Lamb chops? Lamb loin chops. They are amazing. And Brenda's a great cook, and I really like that. So... I want to remind you as they're continuing to serve you, uh, those of you join us in Tulsa, Thursday night is going to be powerful. Registration is at like 12,000 people at the Maybe Center at ORU. So it's going to be amazing. Mario Murillo, our ministry will be there. Lance Walnow, of course, Pastor Gene Bailey, the host of Flashpoint. And uh, Brother Kenneth Copeland will be there also. It's going to be a powerful night. Then Friday night, Mario Murillo is going to have a healing and miracle service. How many are going? I think I asked on Friday. Thank you. We'll see you there. It's going to be a fantastic time. So we'll, we'll look forward to, to seeing all of you there. I wanted to mention this. Open your Bible to John chapter 20. So I don't know if you heard about this. So there was a pastor that was preaching very strong about people need to get out and invite their neighbors, uh, their people in their neighborhood to the resurrection service the following Sunday. And so he was preaching it, and he was preaching it really hard. And so later that week, the pastor was walking in the neighborhood where the church is, and he saw Johnny and all the other little uh, church uh, Sunday school boys were walking with little Johnny. And the pastor went up to them and said, well, what are you guys doing? They said, well, pastor... We are knocking on doors and ringing bells. He was so excited that they had listened to his message. He said, can I come along with you? They said, sure. So they get to the next house. They ring the doorbell. And all of a sudden, they start running and they yell, Pastor, run! Okay, so I told two stupid jokes, okay. The first service was horrible. Brenda, did you get that joke? They were ringing doorbells and running. I get it, I get it. I get it. So if you, how many of you got the joke? Raise your, how many did not get the joke? How many wish you never heard the joke? No, 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 no. I got a sassy second service here. Did it really go over your head? Let's open up to the Holy Scripture, shall we? Please, online, tell me, somebody tell me that you got it. Got it. Got it. Officer Herrick, you got it. Your wife got it over there, didn't you? She's shaking her head. Your wife, she got it. But then again, she lives with all your weird jokes, so, okay. <laughs> all right, John chapter 20. I want you to see this, and those of you that are watching, resurrection begins in the darkness. Now, this is very important because, you know, a lot of people right now think that it's never going to get any better. There's people that think that this is the way it's always going to be, that, you know, the world is just getting so evil, so dark, so bad. Can anything good come out of all of this? And I want you to understand something, and, and those of you that are watching and in chapel, uh, in our chapel there, I want you to see that if you read the first I would say, well, I, I limited it down to 18 verses. There are so many signs in here that the disciples and Mary should have understood that something supernatural had happened. And I want you to know that because I believe the same way. It's always dark before the dawn. Whenever it's dark throughout history, you can read it in the Bible or you can look at history. Whenever it seemed dark, it seemed hopeless, God always had a way of interjecting himself into the darkness and turning something so amazing out of it. And so this is no different. 
The story of the Resurrection Sunday, let's begin in verse 1. Notice how it began. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still what? It was still dark. Mary Magdalene came to the tomb. You know, the place where it looked like there was no hope. And I want you to notice this. Saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. Underline it. Make note of that. We're going to talk about that stone. Now, that should have been Mary's clue. Everything that Jesus said, that he would rise again on the third day, that stone being removed was proof. Because you have to understand, under Roman authority, working with the hierarchy religious community of the high priest and those who wanted nothing more to get rid of Jesus, they literally made sure that that tombstone would be sealed. That tombstone, they say historically, was anywhere between one and a half to two tons or more. It took a lot of effort to seal the tomb. Now she's coming in the dark and she sees that the stone has been removed. But I want you to know something. We're going to talk about this in a moment. This stone, like you see in Jesus of Nazareth or the Passion, it just looks like it's rolled to the side. You have to know that when they rolled it down the hill, there was a groove that it kind of came into where they couldn't move it, so to speak. It was to lock it into place. But there was something supernatural that happened to the stone. Not just to the body of Jesus, but to the stone. And I'm going to prove it to you. Now watch this. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple. Now the other disciple is John, the one that's written this particular gospel passage. He refers to himself as the other disciple. So she ran and went and told Simon Peter and John, the one whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they've taken him. And Peter and John set out and went towards the tomb. Now watch this. This is something that I think needs to happen in this day of darkness and evil. The two were running together. Man, if there's anything we need today is we need a unity among the body of Christ. We need to start joining arms with other Christians and fighting for the church, the kingdom of God, righteousness, come on, morality. We need to, like, like Matt said, the righteous need to not conform. We need to link arms together. We need to fight for our nation. Come on, God and country. And so they were running together. But watch this. John outran Peter. Now, that's very important. And I was saying this in the early service. It's like my son, John. You know, he's got big muscle calves. Well, I could outrun my son, John. I know I can because the famous runners, he's laughing at me, but the famous runners, you know this, I uh, said in the first service, Manot, oh, Hussein, Hussein or Hussein Bolt, the guy that, what's his name? Hussein. Hussein. Bolt. Hussein? Manute Bolt's a basketball player. Whatever he is. Okay, Bolt is a basketball player. This guy, the fastest guy in the whole wide world, except Adam. And I said in the first service, Adam was the fastest guy in all history. Because he was the first to win the human race, just so you know. But this guy, uh, the, the, is it the Bolt guy that was the runner? Hussein Bolt. Hussein, I'm trying to say it right. Usain. Usain Bolt. There you go. We'll say it better so I get it. All right, here's the deal. He has these skinny old little calves. And that's why he's the fastest guy in the world. He's not weighed down with these big old calves. So just imagine me and my son John in a race, and you get the picture. I would beat him. So John and Peter were running. And, and notice this. John reached the tomb first. This, this John, right? And he bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings there. But wait a minute. He didn't go in. There was still fear. There was still reservation. There was still something that made him go, whoa, I ran, but I'm not going in. Okay, it's kind of like when a spider shows up at your house. A huge tarantula with big beady eyes. And if it gets under the foundation of your house, it can move it three blocks. You know, those kind of spiders, right? And you know, or you hear a noise at night, 
and you send the wife down with the German shepherds to go find out with their Second Amendment right what the noise is while you stand watch. Or you have her go kill the spider. Yeah, yeah, that's John's attitude. I'm running, I'm excited, but I'm not going in. Peter, you, 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 you go in and see what's going on inside. So the Bible says, and if you think about it, Peter kind of had this personality where he was so bold, he would just say anything. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> That's this service. You guys will just say anything. And so Peter, though, goes in, and he literally begins to look. And watch what he sees. This is so amazing. And so he bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. John didn't. Simon Peter came. He went into the tomb. Man, he didn't even hesitate, man. He just ran right in the tomb. I bet he would have gotten a fist fight, too. And he saw the linen wrappings lying there. And watch this, a cloth. Here's another sign that Jesus did exactly what he said, that he would rise from the dead. And this cloth had been on Jesus' head, but it was not lying with the linen wrappings, but it was rolled up in a place by itself. Now, I've read many theologians say that it literally meant it is finished, it is done. But it also meant, as it was neatly wrapped together, folded separately, to mean I'm coming back. Should have been their clue. Not only was the stone rolled away, now they see this linen cloth, and the other disciple reached the tomb first, went in, saw, and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. They return to their homes, but notice what Mary's doing. Hate to say it. She must have been watching too many chick flicks, but she's, she's, she's crying. Didn't say the dudes were weeping. All the ladies are mad on Easter right now, or resurrection. <laughs> but it's saying Peter stood outside weeping. But notice the lady, she's weeping. And she went and she bent over to look into the tomb. And notice what she saw. Give her credit. Sometimes men, the reason why they don't come to church is because they look at everything in the natural. So see, I'm making up for it, ladies. Women have the ability to see, to connect to the supernatural more than men. Look around. How many more women are in here than men? Give credit, ladies. I just, I'm applauding you. Go ahead. Clap for yourself. Thank you. I, I got out of it. Resurrection service has been resurrected. Okay, there you go. All right, now watch this. No, women have a very strong sensitivity to the spirit realm. And so she saw two angels, one that looked like Pastor Hank, and the other one that looked like Matt. <laughs> I'm making this up. Come on, a year. Two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying. Now watch this. One was at the head and the other at the feet. So you've got one angel over here where Jesus' feet would have been, and another angel over here by where his head would have been. Why? Because if you remember, everywhere that Israel would go carrying the Ark of the Covenant that had the literal presence of God, or what we call God in a box, on top of it, they had two angels, and they called it the mercy seat. And the, one angel would look this way, and the other angel would look this way, and they would be facing each other, which is also symbolic of the mercy seat, or what we call the throne of God in heaven. And so, literally, this would have been another example of what they would have understood. Wait a minute. Look at how the angels are stationed. Yes. I now have access to my Father because of Jesus' shed blood. I now have grace, mercy, and help in the time of need. She should have known it. But instead, watch what happens. The angel has to say to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they've taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they've laid him. When she had said this, she turned around, and she saw Jesus standing there. Now, remember, was it light or was it dark? It was dark. This is where some people are at today in our nation. This is where some people are at in the nation that they live in. They have been listening and partaking so much of all the darkness that has been around us for you know, the last two years, it's been really interesting. Some people say it feels like a movie, seems like a dream, seems like it's never going to end. And yet Jesus is standing there in the midst of darkness. 
He is the light appearing in the darkness. He is the supernatural connection in the darkness. And she does not even know it. That's where some people are at. I just don't think God's ever going to do anything. I don't think ever, anything's ever going to change. I don't think it's ever going to get better. Well, do you understand that Jesus is interjecting himself in the midst of all of the craziness that is happening around the world? He hasn't removed himself. His spirit is still here in the earth. And as long as his spirit is in the earth, you're going to see his supernatural intervention in power. Amen. So she didn't even know Jesus was there. That's where some people are. They, they can't see what Jesus is doing. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And who are you looking for? And she supposed him to be the gardener. Now, why did she think that he was the gardener? Well, for one, they were in a garden. Two, I think Jesus, you know, he loves flowers. He's also called the Rose of Sharon. Something that I, I've been, I, I did just a couple months ago is I would go to the store and buy those little flowers that you just pick up, you know, and, and they only last for like a day. Right? You know what I'm talking about? The, what do they call them, Brenda? Fresh for a day or something like that? I don't know. But anyway, so I went to a flower store and I said, here's what I want to do. I'm tired of the fresh of the day ones. You pay a lot of money for a flower that withers the next day. Can you help me out? And so they put us on a, uh, on a deal where every two weeks you get a new vase and a new kind of flower that shows up for the bride. I love it. I love flowers too as a man. I really do. And uh, so anyway, every, every two weeks she gets new flowers, get, you exchange the vases. And I told Brenda, it's because you wear a label that nobody else wears. And that label is sure fine. <laughs> Amen. So I'm embarrassing her. So I'm looking this way. But anyway. So I can imagine Jesus is probably there, you know, he's, he's probably smelling the flowers, all this stuff. You know, it's about to break forth the dawning of a new day. She's all about darkness. But it was also to say this, the Bible calls Jesus in 1 Corinthians 15, the second Adam. Now think about what happened to the first Adam, the first human created in God's image in a garden, they sinned. And because Adam sinned, the Bible says that we've all fell short of the glory of God. Because of one man's sin, we, we've all sinned. And so what this represents is what Jesus came and paid for on the cross and through his resurrection that we now have restored through him what it was like in the garden. It's been restored. That's why you can go to your fathers in peace and your graves in a good old age. That's why Jesus said in John 10, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. In other words, think about it. Was there sickness in the garden? Do you ever read about Eve having sniffles? Do you ever read about them not having anything? No, they, they had gold. They had silver. They had everything until sin entered in. And then it began to come under what was called the earth curse. So when Jesus came and he appeared, she thought he was a gardener, is to show us that we can live a life through his covenant that we have with him of his blood. We can have a life free from sickness and disease. We can have life and life more abundantly. We don't have to just barely get by. We don't have to live a life of tragedy, calamity, destruction. Come on. Amen? She didn't think he was just some dude. She thought he was a gardener because it has a lot of prophetic meaning. Now look at verse 16. Jesus said to her, Mary, and she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Now watch this. Jesus said, don't, don't touch me. I haven't yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers. Now notice the message that he commissioned her. He commissioned a woman. Anybody that says woman, women can't preach, they ought to be silent in the church, well, they need to tell that to Jesus. He told the very first preacher, a woman, to go tell and preach the gospel, the good news that he's alive. He didn't restrict her. Hey, you're a woman. Um, stay here. Wait for the dudes to come back. Mm -mm. But notice the message in the time of darkness. This is so important. We're going to talk about this in a moment because if you understand what Jesus says right here, you will never, ever fear 
how bad it may appear in the earth. Because you have something so amazing. He said, don't touch me. Let go of me, Mary. I've not yet ascended, watch this, to my father and whose father? Your father. Now, why is this message so important? Because if you really know who the father is, your heavenly father, Jesus even said it to Philip. Philip said, Jesus plainly, man, hey, man, let's put the cards on the table. Jesus, show us the Father. And Jesus, I can imagine him, grabbed Philip. The chosen won't show this, but this is my version. Grabbed him and put him in headlock. He did one of these things on his head. Philip, how long have I been with you, you squirrel? And Philip's like, what are you, how long have I been with you? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Bam, hit him on the head and let go. Because if you want to know who the father was and what he was like, you look at Jesus. And and you have to understand, in times of darkness, your trust is not what the news is telling you. Your trust is not what politicians can do for you. Your trust is in someone who said, now listen, the government changes. Oh, believe me, it changes. They promise one thing in their campaign and they get elected and they forget what they promised. But God is the only one that I know of that stands there in all majesty, might, dominion, power and says, hey, I am the God that changes not. And he follows it up. He says, let every man be found to be a liar, but let me, God, be true. God's never, ever, 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 ever told a lie. So that means when you see God, the Father, you understand how awesome He is. You say, well, Pastor, can you can you give me an example of how good the Father is? Yeah. In Exodus chapter 33. You will find this in verse 18. Moses is just so overcome. And he's, he spent 40 days with God. And he's with God on the top of Mount Sinai. And God and him, oh, I wish I could have been Moses, are speaking to God face to face. And yet Moses says something very powerful. He says, God, I beseech you, I beg you. Every ounce of breath in my body, my heart beats fast for you. I long to see your glory. Now watch this. Watch your God. Watch what he says about himself. Watch his introduction. If you could say anything about yourself, if someone was to say, you know, introduce themselves to you and you were to introduce yourself. What would you say about yourself? Somebody said, hey, describe yourself. Well, I'm nice. Uh, Full of integrity. Maybe that's what you would say. Notice what God says about his description, which reveals what he is like, no matter if it's light and inflation is low and gas prices have dropped and we have our own oil (laughs) and our own resources here, or if it's bad. You know, listen, I got to tell you, I I filled up, I filled up the tank for $20 the other day, full tank for $20. It was on my lawnmower, but 